What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Altitude Show. I'm your host, Dave Brinker. The Altitude Show is brought to you by Mountain Tough Fitness. This is the time of year when people tend to let themselves go a little bit, eat a bunch of crap, not work out. I don't want to be one of those people. You shouldn't either. Use Mountain Tough Fitness app to stay in shape, keep your mind and your body healthy. You can go to the App Store, MTN Tough Fitness app. It's what I use. Several different programs on there, whether you're a beginner or an expert, you have a gym membership or you don't. I work out in my home office all the time. I use the app to do that. It guides me through workouts every day. The team at Mountain Tough is top notch and their programs are specifically tailored for those of us that love the outdoors and want to spend time in the mountains. And I have never been in better shape in my life. I really enjoy, I look forward to it actually, even though it's really hard. So this time of year, don't let your mind and body become second priority. Keep it first priority and keep it in shape. Go to mountaintough.com or go to the app store, get the Mountain Tough app. Use my code DAVE20 to get 20% off your membership. You will not regret it. Today, I have Jim Heffelfinger on the podcast. He is a biologist in Arizona. I met him several years ago on a cow's deer hunt, and uh, he knows everything deer worldwide, the evolution, the biology, and we took a really deep dive. This is one of my favorite conversations I've ever had. He's so knowledgeable. You'll notice that the conversation cuts right in when he's talking about how cow's deer are called cow's deer. That's because the first six minutes of the podcast, we had some tech issues, uh, which just happens. And uh, so you're going to kind of jump in mid sentence in a way, but uh, just, just hang in there. It's a really good conversation. Hope you guys all have a great day. Yeah. The cows deer is named after Elliot cows. who was an old uh, army surgeon in the late 1860s, late 1860s or so in the Southwest. And back then we didn't have biologists and naturalists at all, but what we had was, some of these, some of these army surgeons that were in these remote outposts in the in the west and the southwest, they had this biology background because they were surgeons or they were doctors, and so they also had an interest in in nature. And they were very often the the leading edge of of the natural history movement. And so he was collecting samples. In fact, he was way more interested in collecting samples than he was being the lead surgeon, like he was supposed to be at some of these army posts. And he had never killed a, a, a one of our white-tailed deer, these smaller white-tailed deer. And our white-tailed deer are just subspecies, a smaller subspecies of the normal white-tailed deer that you would see in, in other parts of the country. So he never killed one, but later naturalists that started taking them and, and taking um, specimens and putting them in museums, giving them scientific names. Someone named it after uh, Elliot Cowes just to commemorate all of his contributions to natural history. So his name's Cowes, and so it's technically Cowes Deer. Somewhere along the way, because of the way the name is spelt, probably, people started calling it Coos Deer because it's C-O-U-E-S, and that caught on so well that now about 95% of the people mispronounce it as coos deer. And, and I don't, I try to let people know what the real name is, but I don't, I don't get overexcited about making sure everybody pronounces it correctly. I, I don't really care as long as we acknowledge uh, Elliot Cows is really uh, the namesake of that deer. <laughs> That's funny. It seems like the only people that call it cows deer are the people that live in Arizona and actually know that because everybody that I know calls them coos deer. And uh, well, I would, I would say most people in Arizona call them coos deer. The hunters, the guides, really, um, everybody on social media. It's it's just it's coos deer to everyone, except maybe a few biologists um, like mm-hmm. me. But there was an argument for a long time about you know how do we know that it was really cow, cows deer? How do we know how he pronounced his name? There's mm-hmm. some misinformation out there, but I found uh, he was a real birder. He was a real bird guy. He loved birds, uh, Elliot. And he produced a checklist of birds in North America in the 1860s. And there's a footnote in there that talks about a bird that's named after him also that, that has his name on it, a, coo, a cow something, some kind of uh, bird. And he says in a footnote that the name is pronounced C-O-W-Z. So this is Elliot Cowes in a footnote telling us how to pronounce his own name. So that it's not really in question anymore. It's you just solved a, the uh, riddle. It's just a matter of no, nobody's going to change. It's mm-hmm. too late. So where did cow's deer come from? You say there are subspecies of the normal white-tailed deer, but I've always wondered, like, I, I think I, I, I have so much knowledge to gain around deer. So <laughs> where, so white, like the normal white-tailed deer that's in Iowa, Kansas, like the Midwest, 
even out west like colorado montana uh like where were the original white-tailed deer and how did a cow's deer evolve out of that and like what's the story there yeah yeah good question you you'll get bigger white tails every place else in the country but it's not unusual that you would get um, a smaller form. There are smaller versions of everything in the desert where there's not as much nutrition. And so in most of North America, whitetails are living in, in the eastern forest or they're living along riparian areas in the west. And, and they've got a lot of nutrition. They've got, they've got summers that are just packed full of all you, all you can eat basically all summer. And uh, the whitetails in the southwest were not so much like that. They lived in these drier uh, mountain ranges. And we talked about how lush the desert is, but everything's relative. So we don't have these lush meadows and cornfields that whitetail have in other places. And so they naturally evolve to be a little bit smaller, and that helps them deal with less food available. If you've got a smaller body, you can get everything you need to maintain yourself a lot easier than if you've got a 300-pound whitetail body. So it's not unusual that animals in the southwest and the deserts are a little smaller. Our desert mule deer are a little smaller body size than in the northern Rockies. The Mexican wolf that I work with sometimes is a smaller body size compared to the, the larger wolves. And that's a really common kind of relationship, and it's all tied to maintaining or growing a body that's more efficient and, and lower nutrition like the desert Southwest. So where, where were the original white tailed deer though? Like were, were they always from the mid, from Colorado East and then white tailed, and then they slowly migrated down in the desert and became these cows deer. Or how, how did that relationship work? They were mostly an Eastern white tail. If you look at white tail, well, there's a problem with that. If you look at white tail fossils, they're mostly Eastern United States, um, like at the close of the Pleistocene. The problem with that is it's, it's not easy to tell the difference between white tail and mule deer fossils at that time. They're so similar, but we have 5 million mm. year old fossils in Florida that uh, they're indistinguishable from today's white tail. Um, we've got fossilized uh, white tail antlers wow. in Florida from a couple like two and three million years ago and they look just like whitetail antlers. So we've had the whitetail with us a very long time. It's a it's a little less clear when the mule deer developed, but at some point we've got a western deer. We've got we've got um, evidence that an early deer ancestor seven million years ago came through the Bering Strait through Alaska into North America for the first time. And then later we've got these fossils a couple million years ago in Florida that look like whitetails. And then we, we definitely had these Western deer that are hard to tell the difference in a, in a fossil leg, a piece of a leg uh, bone fossil. It's hard to tell the difference, but we definitely had this Western deer. So at some point, whitetail and mule deer divided into an Eastern type and a Western type. And then we have our blacktails along the, the coast and some of the genetic evidence from some of the research that I was involved in showed that blacktails were probably isolated from mule deer along the, um, the western uh, northern Pacific coast with glaciers. So they were probably trapped there during oh. one of the, the ice ages when we had glaciers. And, and while they were trapped and, and separated, they became a little bit different. They came, they looked a little bit different. Some of their DNA changed pretty dramatically and, and genetically you can tell black tailed deer from mule deer. And then when those glaciers receded, black tailed and mule deer came back together along the Cascade coast of the Cascade uh, mountains, the peak of the Cascade mountains that you're probably familiar with, with hunting. And we do still have black tailed mule deer um, interbreeding Sometimes the locals call them bench legs up there in the mountains, but we've definitely got interbreeding between blacktails and mule deer. And we also, where whitetail and mule deer come together in the more in the middle part of the continent, every place those two species come together, we've got some hybridization interbreeding between whitetail and mule deer. What were the original, do, do, do we have any uh, uh, fossil record or evidence as to the original deer that came across the Bering Strait? like what they may mm -hmm. have looked like or when, what, when they might've existed that eventually we yeah. believe turned into these s species of deer that we now know. Yeah, this is it. Eocolius gentry rorum. That's the fossil from 7 million years ago. That was the original um, deer that came through. And, and for those listening and not watching, it's a, it's an antler that looks very much like a roe deer from mm. Europe, um, which is interesting because roe deer had very similar um, antlers. And interesting, when you look at the genetics of all the European deer species, the red deer and, and roe deer, and, and there's Jabarusa deer and hog deer and all kinds of things, 
the the roe deer in Western Europe is genetically most closely associated with our whitetail and and mule deer from a genetic standpoint. So I think that's wow. really interesting that this seven million year old fossil has antlers that look sort of like a roe deer, which is genetically the the closest. So they probably all had a common ancestor seven to ten million years ago. And these these wow. deer that came over, which was the Eocolius, into North America, mm -hmm. and that's what evolved into all of the whitetail and mule deer that we have in the in, in not only North America but South America has a whole bunch of different species, and they're all related to this Oticolius, the whitetail mule deer kind of class of deer, and they all became completely different species down in South America on their own, but they all came from this common stock that whitetail and mule deer came from. What are the uh, most prominent species in, in South America? You just don't hear much about that. I was watching, I was listening to Joe yeah. Rogan's podcast and he had a gentleman on, I can't remember the guy's name, but he works in the Amazon and he was talking about deer there. And I, I was a little surprised because I actually didn't know there was deer there. Mm -hmm. um, and I just assumed that there was some form of a white-tailed deer, but I, it, they, they didn't really get into it. So I'm just curious, do you know much about the deer down there and sort of what they've evolved into? Yeah. Yeah. They're closely related going down into uh, Central America. And then the, just the Northern cap of South America, you have white tailed deer down there um, that look just like our white tailed deer, but you also probably what he was talking about with the, uh, an Amazon deer, I'm sure he's talking about a brocket deer, which is also very closely related to white tails, but they're, they're not white tails. They normally mature bucks will have, will be spikes. They just don't grow very wow. big antlers. They're small, dark jungle uh, animals that are dark because mm -hmm. they sneak around through the, the jungles. You, you think about deer species like elk and caribou. Some of these species that are out in open landscapes where visual uh, cues are much more important. Caribou, uh, elk, moose, they have giant antlers. And in some cases like um, caribou, very showy, they they the the term is like showy which means they they have a lot of coloration they might be black and white but they have a lot of different coloration on their on their bibs and their rumps you know elk have a big white rump patch caribou are, are very colorful in the front um and that visual that use of uh, the visual more than anything else allows them and, and creates a situation where they've got giant antlers but if you live in a jungle you don't want moose antlers trying to run through the thick jungle underbrush. And so the jungle animals are dark, not very showy, kind of uniform in color, small antlers, and they just slip around through the, the forest. So they were probably talking about brocket deer. As you go farther south in South America, away from the equator, you get into more grasslands, even some mountains up in the Andes. There's two types of mountain deer that have three points on the side. Um, one calls a wamel. I just was a co-author on a scientific paper with some colleagues in South America working on um, uh, the Waymal and, and the kind of their habitat use. There's a Taruka, which is a similar one that's in the northern part of the Andes. And those are mountain deer. And then when you get into the grasslands and the flats and what they call the Pampas, there's um, um, uh, marsh deer, which are kind of a lowland er uh, area, um, Blastoceros. There's about seven or eight South American species. And if you look genetically, they're surprisingly close, re closely related to whitetails, even though they look real different. There's one called a pudu, which is the smallest deer out of the, of the entire 38 or so species of, of uh, deer in the cervid family. And they're just little. They look like little javelina is what they look like. No way. Uh, do all of the 38 s species of deer, or do you say sp species of deer, 38 species of deer? That, that yeah, I, I did. I did say species of deer, but you know, some of these there's a lot of argument about whether they're really subspecies or whether okay. one is really two. Species. So you know the way biologists are. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But let's just say there's 38 uh, species. Uh, where did they all origin? Can they all be brought back to like a one thing that happened millions of years ago, and then they all uh -huh. started? Because you, you you talked about how this 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 deer seven million years ago came over this the straight or whatever. And then it turned into the black tail and the mule deer and the white tail. Did that same deer and forgive my ignorance. Cause I'm like, science was mm -hmm. not my best subject, but did that no, same deer when you go that help create back. caribou and moose and like, where mm -hmm. did, where did all those things or elk? Where did all those things come from? 
Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. That's a good question because people talk about when they came over from the Bering Strait, but not many people talk about, well, where did they come from before that? They came from somewhere. And the earliest fossils of the deer family are in um, Southeast Asia. There's a, um, a Procolius, which you can tell by the name. They're starting to, I mean, they're starting to use words that are later used for Odicolius. But there's early fossils where it looks like they have a series of fossils and it looks like at some point the animal kind of keeps these horn-like structures. And then other cases, it looks like they shed them. And so there's fossils at the very beginning of what they consider the deer family when it looks like these animals are evolving the ability to drop their antlers and then grow new ones the next year, which is a pretty remarkable process. But they have fossils from that very beginning. And then starting to see some different forms like um, Stephanosemus and Dicroceras, where they definitely shed their antlers every every year. And then into more elaborate forms uh, after that. So there are fossils that kind of show that genesis from like a goat-like, not so much a camel-like animal, but just kind of a generic ungulate in ev evolution, a hooved animal in evolution. And then you can see that point in the fossil record where these things called antlers show up. And then suddenly they're like shed every year, which is pretty remarkable and grown back. And then from that, you can trace um, just that kind of radiation into different kinds of, of uh, deer species. But certainly started in Asia, more and more deer species, including the big um, Irish elk, which wasn't exclusively Irish and it, it wasn't actually an elk either. The big elaborate deer species in Europe and Asia and then seven million years ago, you get some early deer stock coming to North America, and then that turns into everything we know in North America, including um, whitetail and mule deer um, that are, are more North American species. Now, the elk and the moose are what they call circumpolar. They're around the whole globe up on the northern part of the, uh, the globe. And so the caribou is our version of Europe's reindeer. Those are subspecies of the same species, reindeer in Europe and Scandinavia and caribou in the U.S. And then the moose also, there's a European moose, which is much more closely related to our uh, several kinds of American moose. Um, and our elk actually, our, our elk are, are the same species as red deer in, um, in Europe. And elk came into North America much later than whitetail and mule deer. And that's why red deer and elk look so similar. It was, a, they call it a Sagamonian interglacial, which is just a gap in between two ice ages. That was probably, forgot the exact date of the Sagamonian, but it was really probably only 10, 15,000 years ago, like towards the end of the Pleistocene, that we got elk for the first time. And that's why our elk look so similar to the, the red deer. In, in, so you uh, said Europe. red deer and elk are the same species? They are. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Cervus elaphus um, is the, the name. And for years, it was Cervus elaphus elaphus, which was the European red deer. And then elk were Cervus elaphus canadensis. Um, in, in recent times, and I've started to use it too, uh, they're starting to call them different species, which I support that because the red deer it's got a different vocalizations. It roars instead yeah. of bugles. They really look different. They've got crowning on top of the antlers, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, our elk have these whale tails, a big split in the back. Physically, yeah. they look different. Um, yep. So I support this. It, recently, they're being called separate species. Cervus candidensis in the U.S. for elk and Cervus elaphus in uh, red deer in Europe. So explain, the, spl explain in layman's terms how it happens that we have let's just let's talk car caribou slash reindeer for a second so i'm assuming reindeer started off in asia ish europe ish and then moved uh, i guess it would be east across the land bridge and then mm -hmm. populated into canada and north america is that true yep that's right okay and, and at a very late Oops. date i don't know the date of that but hey, hey jim hold date. on one second i gotta i gotta plug my computer in just give me a second Okay. <laughs>
I'm back. Yep. All right, reindeer. So if that's true, they came across the land bridge and populated North America. Tell me why, evolutionarily speaking, like the reindeer stayed so similar to its, or excuse me, the caribou stayed so slim, similar to its distant mm-hmm. relative, whereas like a, uh, and even like a moose, same thing. The moose in Sweden yep. uh, are virtually identical to the moose in Alaska, for example, or British Columbia, minus mm-hmm. small variables, smaller antlers or whatever. Uh, why does that happen? But then you have the roe deer and a mule deer. Does that make yep. sense? Yeah, it, it it does. It makes sense. It's a, and so you're talking about how did they stay so similar? Yes, being yes. It's and just for. Is, I, go ahead. The, the answer is that split was not as far back. I mean, that split was was much more recent than oh. it, than things like even elk and red deer are a little bit different. So it all goes back to how long have they been separated in in oh. Europe or North America? And gotcha. So the elk and red deer really the, the elk came over the Bering Strait into North America towards the end of the Pleistocene. Um, and the same with caribou and, and reindeer real late. Whereas the, the uh, kind of the white tail and mule deer being so different from roe deer, that's because that was 7 million years ago, not 15,000 years ago. Got so it. All that, well, that, time that makes perfect sense to be different. So it's all about the timing of, of when they split. One interesting thing about, Red deer in, in Western Europe are so different from elk. Anybody can, anybody with some knowledge can, can look at a red deer and look at an elk and know, can tell the difference between the two. Yes. What's interesting is if you get over into Asia, um, like China, those animals look very much like wapiti. They look very much like our elk. And so the split isn't the Bering Strait where you have a red deer looking oh. thing in Eurasia and an elk what we call elk wapiti in North America, the split is actually farther west. So it's really interesting that some of these Eastern China subspecies of red deer look just like wapiti. It's pretty fascinating. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that is, that is really, really fascinating. So how long was this land bridge open to travel? If Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing that's not fully understood. It was, it was open to travel um, intermittently in all of these ice ages. So we always think of the ice age. We always think of the Pleistocene and the, the, the glacial maximum was 18,000 years ago when the, when the glaciers were at their maximum. And those glaciers were taking a whole bunch of seawater uh, to form all of that ice in the glaciers. And when they did that, the sea level um, was lower. And so it exposed this land bridge between Alaska and Russia. And that's how these animals came across. And we think of like the Pleistocene and 18,000 years ago when glaciers were at their maximum and that land bridge was exposed. But what we don't think about is the Pleistocene ended 10,000 years ago, but the Pleistocene itself goes back 2 million years. And there were, and even before that is what we call the Pliocene, which is the period before that. There was these ebbs and flows of glacier uh, um, ice ages. Ice ages came and dissipated and came and dissipated. So there, this land bridge was exposed and available for travel and then disappeared under the ocean and then was exposed again a whole bunch of times throughout the last 30 million years. And we don't know which time it was that some of these animals came across. And people have written papers and, and tried to do kind of match up the genetics with the glacier information. That's all really interesting, but it's hard to tell exactly when some things came over and, and, um, and sort of to differentiate from their, their European relatives. Uh, is there any, has there been any attempts for like deep sea exploration in that area in terms of trying to find fossils on the ocean mm-hmm. floor and stuff yeah. like that? I've just never heard of that, but I'm, I'm yeah, assuming they would have really done that. Out- yeah, not really out in the ocean between Alaska and Russia because those seas are just nasty. Yeah. But along the southeast Alaska islands and along the Alaskan shore, there has been a lot of work and some really interesting things found, like like settlements, you know, that are underwater now that were mm-hmm. at the, the ocean's edge back then when the sea level was, was mm. a lot lower. Wow. Yeah, I but always it, heard I always heard with blacktail and mule deer that and this might have been a myth based on what you just told me. I think it might be that blacktail were first and then 
some of these blacktails went over the cascades and then became separated. Uh, and you know, they went out the, the high desert, therefore their antlers got a little bigger and wider. Their bodies got a little mm-hmm. smaller and lighter. Yep. Um, is that kind of, is that in any way, that, shape or form the, accurate? Yeah, that's one of the theories. And the, and the truth is we don't know exactly how that happened. I've spent 30 years thinking about it and I haven't figured it out. And a lot of other people have too. And what you're, what you're remembering is some of the, one of the theories is that we had this, um, this Western deer and the Eastern deer, like I was talking about Eastern deer or white tails. But one of the theories is that the Western deer was this black tail. And then when the glaciers receded, the black tails then spread out into most of Western North America and that rapid spread and that productive post-glacial habitat gave them so much nutrition. They got bigger bodies and became mule deer. Basically you got Mm -hmm. bigger bodies, bigger antlers, occupying that more open habitat, more showy, um, like a white bib and the black forehead on mule deer Mm -hmm. and became these bigger open, um, open habitat animals. That's one of the theories. And we discussed all of these theories in the chapter one of the book. I, uh, of the chapter I co-authored, uh, which is ecology and management of blacktail and, and, and mule deer in North America, which just came out less than a, a year ago. And I spent a lot of time in that first chapter exploring all of these theories and then talking about what parts of that theory make sense and what parts um, don't make sense in, in that, in that regard. Okay. And what do you think, after all that research, is the most likely conclusion that you came to? Yeah, I, I think what, what has the most support is that we've got this, this bigger western mule deer, um, eastern whitetail, and at some point some of the mule deer on the coast were isolated and became very different, very different genetically and somewhat different um, physically before glaciers receded and they came back together. Gotcha. The Altitude Show is brought to you by GoHunt.com. GoHunt is the the hunting company. Anything that you need for hunting out west, you can find at GoHunt.com, whether that be their world-class gear shop. They have all the best brands vetted by their amazing hunters that work at GoHunt. Trust me, it's the best brands. I I do almost all of my hunting shopping on GoHunt.com. But also just their research tools. Like, Like the whole year, you should be doing research, whether that be studying their maps or reading articles from the likes of Brady Miller or Trail Kreitzer, or looking up your drawing odds in various states and when to put in. There's so much information, and it's a great resource. Go to GoHunt.com, use my code ALTITUDE, and you'll get 20% off on just about everything I just mentioned. But you should become an insider. When you become an insider, you can get access to all of these things. So go to GoHunt.com, use my code ALTITUDE for 20% off. Okay, when we talk about the evolution of deer, um, I spent a considerable amount of time writing all of my thoughts down on all of this stuff. I've been following the literature, the scientific literature, following what people are writing for decades. And we, we were writing a book over the last five years or so called the Ecology and Management of, of Black-Tailed and Mule Deer in North America. Just came out. Fantastic book. It, it five over 500 pages, over 100 color photographs. There was 82 co-authors contributed to, to 23 chapters in the book. So this thing is going to be the Bible um, for decades to come of anything mule deer or black tailed deer. And, and so it was the experts of all these topics in North America that wrote that chapter and contributed to whatever chapter it was they were an expert on. So it'll be, it'll be the source for that kind of information. For example, we've got seven of the chapters are, um, are the seven eco regions in North America. So there's a whole chapter on coastal rainforests. And, and talks all about deer ecology and deer management and how deer uh, interact with um, the coastal rainforest. And, and that's mostly blacktail deer, of course, and Sitka blacktail in the north and in the Columbian blacktail. And then there's a, it, um, the Intermountain West ecoregion. There's a whole chapter on that. There's a whole chapter on the Great Plains. So, so people who are in those kind of environments, the Great Plains or coastal rainforest, you can go to that chapter and, and it's like a miniature book all about the, the area you hunt in and, and the habitat you're familiar with and the deer that you hunt. So that, that's just seven of the 23 chapters. The other ones deal with um, um, predation. There's a whole chapter on physical characteristics, which has a lot on antler development that I've written a lot about. Chapter one that, that I was getting to is about the the classification, taxonomy, and the evolution of, of mule deer and as it relates to whitetail, some of the things that we were talking about 
And so I've spent a considerable amount of time just writing down all the things, all the thoughts that people have, have out there about how meals are evolved and how they're related to, to other species. And so if you're interested in what we were talking about, that's, that's the source that has all the latest information uh, in it. And that's available now um, anywhere, really. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I, I co-edited it with Paul Krausman, who's a longtime professor at University of Arizona, someone I've worked with for a couple of decades. He's, he's um, published a lot of books. He and I are both Walmo Award winners, which is given to the leading mule deer and black tailed deer person in, in, um, in North America every, every other year. A, a whole bunch of other Walmo Award winners that contributed to that. So it's, it's really, if you're interested, um, there's uh, in the show notes, we can put a link to the, the best way to get it is probably the publisher, which is uh, Rutledge, R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E, Rutledge.com. And I say that because they always have discounts run, running. So if you go to the publisher website, you probably get a discount um, from that. What were the biggest takeaways from all the research that went into that for you? I, I'm most specifically interested, for the sake of right now at least, in the blacktail. The blacktail is a very mysterious and under, I wouldn't say under, yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. unrepresented in, in the in the deer world, right? Like not yeah, a lot of people get to that. interact with it unless you live in the coastal regions of the West and Northwest. Um, but for those of us that live around them, they're a fascinating creature and they're much different than mm -hmm. the mule deer and the whitetail. I mean, I've, I've hunted all the subspecies of deer in the in North America and successfully harvested all of them, except for the Colombian whitetail, which I haven't got yet. But mm -hmm. other than that, I have. And what I will say is I still find the black, like the coastal blacktail to be, and I'm not counting Californian blacktails. No offense. I love hunting mm -hmm. California blacktails. They're beautiful, but I'm more talking about these true coastal Northwest Oregon, Washington blacktails where I live. Um, they're just so mysterious and so difficult to see and interact with and learn and difficult to pattern. I just find it so they're just a fascinating creature. So what were your biggest takeaways on blacktails specifically? Yeah. Blacktail. You're right about blacktails being kind of the neglected, not talked about um, cousin of mule deer. So both blacktail subspecies, the Sitka blacktail in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia, and then South in southern British Columbia and the west coast of Oregon and Washington and Northern California is a Colombian blacktail. Those two blacktail subspecies have um, a type of DNA that's very different from the rest of mule deer. It's really remarkable how different <laughs> it their mitochondrial DNA is. Mitochondrial DNA doesn't come from both parents. It comes, it gets passed down only in the maternal line from grandmother to mother to females. Um, and you just pass down from your mother, basically. That's very different in those blacktails, which is really interesting. And that goes into and supports what I was talking about before, about those blacktails must have been isolated along the coast during one of the, the glacial advances and, and became very different genetically and a little different physically. Um, but I sit here in the Sonoran Desert and I'm, I'm fascinated by blacktails. I think they're so, they're so cool. I think they, they represent what was probably a real primitive kind of Oticolius or, or um, mule deer, even though they're not the root of, of mule deer evolution, they think they represent some real primitive characteristics because they look very much, especially when you get up to Sitka, very much like a white tail. I mean, their tails, the Sitka black tail, tails look an awful lot like white tail, which is really confusing and really interesting. But you're seeing um, the black tail really get its due lately, I think. There's a lot more attention being paid to Blacktail deer before they were just kind of thrown in as two different subspecies of, of mule deer, which they are, but we can't let them just kind of be neglected and, and um, ignored just because they're subspecies of, of mule deer because they're very different ecologically and, and somewhat different physically. And so I'm, I'm really excited that when you see like the Mule Deer Foundation is, is really advancing and, and um, doing a lot more when it comes to mule deer conservation or black tailed deer conservation and highlighting that. I've written two magazine articles in Mule Deer Foundation on black tail specifically just to help highlight that. They had, um, a, a, I think they had a black tail on the cover. They've got a mm. new Alaska Mule Deer Foundation chapter in Alaska that's working on Sitka black tailed deer habitat. And they have a mm -hmm. representative, um, Jim Bachtel, who lives on uh, 
um, Prince of Wales Island in Southeast Alaska, and he's their representative. And I think they're starting another Alaska chapter. You're starting to see a lot more emphasis on black-tailed deer so that they're not mm. just covered up by their their glory hog cousin, the, the mule deer that everybody talks about. Yeah, I'm, I've certainly been seeing more, especially in the hunting world. I get people that are like, man, Roosevelt's fall in the same category, by the way. They'll be like, hey, I, I need to come out there and do that. I keep hearing about this and that, and they're beautiful, and gosh. And uh, when I, you know, growing up here, my dad and his friends and even my grandfather who moved out here from Pennsylvania in like the 50s, um, they hunted blacktails. I mean, it was like the heyday of blacktails. I mean, I still, I think even today the world record or at least it's in the top three came from like 20 minutes from my hometown. And it was like 190 inch black tail or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something crazy, something that doesn't, I don't believe exists today probably. Um, but they, they've gone, they go through a lot of ebbs and flows just like mule deer do. And, uh, they've had some real, real struggles, habitat changes, over predation, Mm -hmm. over hunting, all the, all the same normal problems that we see across the West. But I was reading an article, um, and maybe maybe you know more about this than I do. I was reading an article the other day in Oregon Hunter Magazine that the pop- blacktail populations are either remaining the same or going up in most units, mm-hmm. which I was pleased to see because compared to when I was growing up to, say, five, ten years ago, it was pretty bleak. Mm-hmm. You'd go out, and it was just it was very difficult to find a mature buck. Now, that's still the case. But in the age of trail cameras, what I've realized is it might not have been that it was, um, it was definitely harder to find a mature black tail than probably in my dad's heyday when they were less educated, there was probably more of them, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was partially that, but I think mostly the fact that people just don't realize how freaking nocturnal they are and how, how they live mostly solitary. These big bucks live solitary lives, except for a few days a year where they come out in the daylight. I did it this year. I did a, uh, uh, my own little research project, Jim. I'm no biologist, but uh, <laughs> I had I had out basically seven to ten cameras at all times, starting in September. Actually, all the way through September, and I they're still out right now. So, like, what is that? About three months. And I did a couple, a, a lot less cameras, but the same thing last year. And what I found was something my black tail hunting buddy already told me, which was the bucks that we were hunting, the big, these big mature bucks, they showed their face in the daylight in terms of the records that we have under four times in, in those two months where the, the pre rut, the rut and the post rut happened. And even in the second estrus, which only lasted like a couple days in my area. Mm -hmm. So like, and then they're just off to the right. And and now they are like, they've vanished absolutely Mm -hmm. vanished and it stopped within like it was like a november 28th and boom ghosts again so i'm just like god but anyways i'm I'm rambling but my point of that was uh i realized how many bucks there were in this area i was hunting i would have bet there was maybe a couple but there ended up being like a dozen to 15 Mm -hmm. that would frequent this area and they were you know they were they were, they lived there. I mean, they were, they were there. It's not like they were just traveling through. In fact, we didn't get very many roaming bucks. We didn't get very many bucks that we didn't have before. So what I learned was, is there was a lot more deer in this area than I thought, which, uh, which made me think about the past when I'm like, oh, there's no deer there. There's no, there's no big bucks there. It's like, well, maybe I just wasn't seeing them because they don't mm-hmm. show their face. And why would these bucks after generations of getting shot and clear cuts, why would these big bucks come out in a clear cut in, in the daylight, which is where most people out here hunt them. <laughs> like, I mean, eventually right. they're going to, they're going to become keen to that and they just go out there at night. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you say they disappeared like the end of November, that's um, you're saying they didn't disappear and new bucks showed up. Like these the bucks just starting to roam, starting to pick up new bucks, but they just probably post rut went into hiding. Is that what you think? Yeah. So they rutted uh, in our area. Um, they, the rut, was like basically how well it started around the 25th of october um yeah really got going right at halloween and then it went really well kind of sporadically for the first 10 days of november like there'd be a day where there'd be nothing and then it would heat up again yeah now keep in mind this area i'm hunting probably only has 10 to 15 does so Mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot to get them bred right Mm -hmm. um 
But the 10th of November, it just shut down, like just fell right off a cliff. And it was dead until about the 25th. And then it was kind of good again, but not quite as good as the beginning of November until the 28th. And then it was just done. Now we're getting zero pictures of bucks, maybe one a week when we were getting 10 a day, it, it, mostly yeah. at night, but we were still getting yep. them. Yeah. Um, wow. Like they're just either they're not there or they're not moving or yeah, both. It, I don't it, know. <laughs> yeah, it's typical after the rut. They 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 expend so much energy and they're not eating that after the rut they got to recuperate and they just go find some heavy cover and you don't see them moving around um, much anymore. And mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned the the second estrus. That's probably pretty rare. Um, Utah has about fifteen hundred GPS collars on mule deer right now. Follow them around, and I heard one of the researchers recently talk about they were looking for evidence of a second peak of the does that didn't get bred. They couldn't mm -hmm. find any evidence of it. And they, they got really they get more data than anyone else. I think that's, wow. I think that's talked about more than it really is a reality. I think most of the, unless you've got an unusual situation, most of the does are getting bred during this bell shaped curve. And there isn't this second kind of estrus that's very common at all. What do you think that what's the research suggest that that is? Because I know that out when I've hunted out Midwest whitetails, that these guys are seeing a lot of activity right there around the end of November, beginning of December again, when there was that big lull in the middle. So it's almost like the bell curve. It doesn't, it's not yep. as good as the first one, but there's mm -hmm. almost like this big, uh, they call it lockdown or whatever in the middle. Yeah. And then, and then it goes back up just barely. And then it's just done. So what, what is, what does yeah. science suggest that that is, if it's not a second estrus estrus, it's, it's probably because when you, when you look at when the does are actually like getting pregnant, which is what they mm -hmm. did in Utah, they find a bell-shaped curve. They don't find the second lump, the second smaller hmm. hump of does getting bred, you know, 28 days later or something. They just hmm. find one big bell-shaped curve. So that's that's the best evidence you've got. When you're looking at, like, movements all of a sudden pick up uh, three or four weeks after the peak of rut, and everybody's interpreting that as a second estrus, who knows what that is? If that's farmers cutting corn in, in Wisconsin and all of a sudden that cover is not there or the colder weather has them moving more during the day. I, you know, I don't, mm. I don't know what it is, but I think it's probably some other factors that people are interpreting as a second rut. But when you collect real data on conception of bonds, you don't see it. What's interesting out here, Jim, is I have a buddy who's like, he did what I'm doing for like 15 years um, before before these, the trail camera thing was widely used, he had them and he was doing this. He had like 30 some cameras up on one property and he just studied these blacktails for years. You get to and he, know a lot that way. Yes. And, uh, he, he told me before this season, cause I called him, I'm like, Hey, when, when should I expect the best movement? I don't have a lot of days. And he's mm -hmm. like, dude, it's like clockwork. Your buck, your, your bucks that you're after are going to come out between the Halloween and the sixth. They're going to walk by your stand. You better be sitting there when they're there. If you're not, you're screwed. And then they're going to walk by it again in the daylight somewhere right around the 27th to December 2nd, and then it's really? done. Yep. And I swear to you, Jim, he was exactly, not just kind of right, he was exactly right. Like the 28th is when that, I actually ended up shooting a, a smaller buck for meat when I was, when I was dragging him out, um, uh, or excuse me, the next day I, I looked at the cameras that, that my target buck literally walked by my area on the 28th of November in the daylight. And I hadn't seen him in like two weeks. Uh, so I don't know if that was just dumb luck or whatever, but it, mm -hmm. it seems like something happened. And you might be right. I mean, the weather did change. It got colder, more stormy. Uh, who knows? Maybe they're changing habitat or the food changes. Yeah, there's always, it's it's like, it's the same thing where when guys start debating like, uh, you know, the, the moon phases and all these mm -hmm. things are, you know, there's so many variables between hunting yep. pressure and food and uh, weather and uh, yep. estrus cycles. And it's all the same debates, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. I mean, yeah. if that's there's what never... the, the data suggests, then, I mean, I can't argue it for sure. But it, I, I mentioned Utah because they've got, there's no one that has that amount of data on when falls are being born and when does are, are getting pregnant. And so when you look at a huge data set like that, it's less subject to um, other influences. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they've, got, they've got good data there. And, and in order to, move, in order to do that, they, they, they somehow date, like they find out when the fawn was born and yeah. then they just roll it back. However many days it takes for them to 
they, okay. they capture so many deer. They capture um, a bunch of females in the, in the mm-hmm. wintertime when they're pregnant. So after the rut, they catch females when they're pregnant. And they put a little device called a, a VIT, which stands for vaginal implant transmitter. And they actually put a, a cylindrical um, transmitter up into the vaginal canal. And it sits in there. And when the fawn is born, it falls out with the fawn. And when it falls out, the temperature change from a warm body to cold air triggers um, the telemetry and tells the researchers exactly when the fawn was born. And then they can locate it through the radio telemetry and wow. get right to the bedside. So they know when the fawn, they know what time of day, not even what day. They know mm-hmm. what time of day on what day, and they know exactly where it was born. And you, wow. you multiply that by hundreds and hundreds of does, you start getting some pretty good data about when they're having their fawns, and you can back up 205 days is, is usually the average. And that's, that's the uh-huh. peak of conception of when they conceived. So you can get some really, really neat information. Wow. That's really interesting. Why do the, explain to the layperson why the ruts, the, the estric cycles vary so much between geographies, like, uh, in Arizona, the, yes, the, it, the, de- the deer. Naturally. Yeah. Go no, ahead. We've, when we translocated deer, we, we messed that up because there, there's a genetic component to when the breeding season is. And if you bring does from white tailed does from Michigan and you bring them down to Mississippi, which they did, they had some captive deer that were Michigan deer in, in Michigan. And the guy I worked for, Dr. Harry Jacobson at Mississippi State University had captive deer. They brought Michigan deer down into the Mississippi pens and vice versa. And they found that for a couple years those those would retain that breeding season and there's some other evidence too of of females re- for much longer than that retaining their genetically programmed breeding season from some other environment and so do you think we, that was partially wouldn't that and i'm no scientist but would that be partially habitual like they're just used to like they're triggered at a certain time of year uh it, no i think it's a it's a genet it's a genetic programming and, mm. and it's genetic, it's related to, to a photo period. So the, the lengthening of the days and the shortening of the days in the fall, we know that with, you know, it gets dark earlier in the fall. And that's because the, the amount of daylight is in the, during the day is shortening. And a lot of animals in nature are queuing off of those changes throughout the year of the amount of daylight. And that's what drives the antler cycles in deer. That's what drives breeding season. But even though that, that daylight clock can be the same on, on the planet, Animals in different geographic areas are genetically programmed to to actually breed at different times during that that cycle. And the reason that is 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 just strictly biologically where the animal is and where it evolves and what it adapts to. It it times that actually the fawn drop. It wants to make sure that the fawns are dropped at the most optimum time. And so in Wisconsin, white-tailed deer are going to drop their fawns in late May, early June, just as things are greening up. The summer's in, in um, full-blown summer with a lot of green vegetation, a lot of cover to hide the fawns, a lot of food for the does, a lot of food for the fawns when they start weaning. But if you drop white-tailed fawns in Arizona in at the end of May, early June, that's right in the middle of our extremely dry period before the summer monsoons come in, in July, all of those fawns would die if they were born at the same time. So our whitetails are dropping fawns in like the first week in August. And that's because we get the summer rains in July, things start greening up, and then the fawns hit as soon as everything's greened up. So animals through time have adapted to breeding at a certain time to make sure that their fawns are born at the most optimum mm-hmm. time. So that's mm-hmm. where it gets genetically programmed to, to breed at a certain time so that that works out. Because all of the fawns that were dropped it, throughout evolution, if fawns were dropped in May and June in Arizona, they all died. And so that genetic stock ends. But the animals that breed um, later in, in, say, late December throughout January, the whitetails, they're dropping their fawns at the right time and those genetics continue on. So that can, just through natural selection, that can, the animal gets adapted to when the best time is to drop their fawns. Uh, that's really interesting. How, uh, hold on. Uh, that's, that is fascinating. It's always, I guess I've always just kind of assumed that, but didn't, didn't all the way get there in my brain. So how long does a normal estrus, like t- truly based on the data, how many days is the estrus cycle specifically for that 
research that was done in Utah, like how many days are the mule yeah. deers truly? Oh, it's like the maybe from like the, the like just the middle part of that bell curve. Yeah, I don't that that period of time doesn't come so much from the way they were doing the research with the, okay. the implant transmitters. But people, you, you get that information more from just behavioral observations. Like Valerius Geist was a well-known ungulate ecologist. We lost him a couple of years ago. Um, he spent a lot of time early in his career observing mule deer breeding behavior. Mm. And so just observing how long that buck is tending the doe and staying with her. And he did that in like Banff National Park and places that weren't, weren't hunted. It didn't have a lot of uh, other human disturbance. He was able to just hang around with some of those buck groups and, mm -hmm. and see that breeding activity. And he's documented that pretty well. And it, it's like, it can be as short as 24 hours or 36, maybe 48 hours where that doe's really receptive. But he may mm -hmm. be hanging around before that because he knows what's coming. And he knows mm -hmm. that she's almost an estrus. And he's he's testing her urine. You've heard of the flamen, um, the lip curl. Mm -hmm. they, uh, all the deer, they have uh, an organ on the roof of their mouth called the vomeronasal organ. And mm -hmm. it's not used for anything else that people know about other than sampling um, sampling how close the doe is to estrus. So when they get into that period where it's, she's getting really close, he's tending, she'll squat and urinate, and the buck will come up and sample. Just with his lips and tongue, he'll sample some of that urine. And then he throws his head back and curls his upper lips up and does what's called, it's a German word, flamen and does a lip curl or flaming, and that draws that urine back into that vomeronasal organ. And, and that allows him to sense how close she is to estrus. And wow, that's that, really that interesting. organ is actually related to, um, like in rattlesnakes, that, that same kind of vomeronasal organ where they pull their, they stick their tongue out and they get some molecules on their tongue and then they stick it in that organ, rattlesnakes, they stick it in that organ and they can sense the molecules on the end of the tongue. It's all kind of evolutionarily related. It's the same kind of organ, but deer are actually doing that. Wow. That's really interesting. I didn't know they actually tasted the urine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> uh, um, so let's talk a little bit about cow's deer. Again, fascinating creature. One of the hardest things I've ever hunted. They are. Um, some of the hardest terrain I've ever hunted from the standpoint of like trying to get close to something. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like they must have evolved with some pretty badass predators because those deer have evolved to have some of the best senses of any animal I've hunted. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're definitely in the top three ish, probably like yeah. pronghorn axis deer coos deer, you know, would probably be the top three in my book. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about their past and kind of where they came from, what they had to survive through to get to where they, cause they're, they're plentiful. I mean, I think their numbers are doing very well. At least when I've been down there, it seems yep. anecdotally like they're doing well. So they've, they found a way to survive in a really harsh environment full of predators mm -hmm. and you know, where did they come from? How'd that happen? Yeah, they're just, they are finely tuned um, anti-predator devices for sure. But I'm not sure they had many more predators than other animals. You think about the Northern Rockies, you think about um, some of the Northern mule deer that had grizzly bears and mm -hmm. probably higher densities of wolves for sure. Coyotes on the, the fawns. Um, certainly cows, whitetail. I think part of the issue is the open country that they occupy. You mm -hmm. live in that open country and, and they use their senses um maybe they're scent less although they're pretty good at smelling you can't get upwind of them for sure but i think mm -hmm. they use their visual acuity a lot more than other whitetails because they're out in that open habitat and mm -hmm. so it, and you don't have a lot to hide behind and you're walking on like corn chips when you're trying to stock up with yeah dude bow it's, range it's so insane it, it's absolutely tough but there's no mm -hmm. doubt they seem to be wired a lot tighter than a lot of other white tails I've had experience with in the Midwest and the Southeast. So you don't think like, uh, I, I just don't know about much about the predators. I know right now there's mountain lions mm -hmm. there. There's coyotes. There, there are still some, what do they call them? Uh, the, like the, the, is it no, a puma is just a mountain lion, right? What yeah, are the, yeah. isn't it? What are the big cats down there that have been spotted? Are they leopards? Oh, they, there, there's a, um, jaguars that jaguar, are found in Arizona. We, we don't have more than one at a time. One will come up, set up camp and, and spend years in a mountain, but that's really the only one. Um, they'll certainly be deer predators, but not numerous enough to, um, 
really to impact them that much. Really? It's, it's that little? There's just one? Just one. Yeah. There's so many trail cameras in these, what we call mountain islands. We talked about uh-huh. earlier. Uh-huh. People have so many cameras in there in all the canyons and all the saddles and all the choke points for deer. And now um, a lot of researchers with a lot of cameras looking for jaguars and looking for mm-hmm. a smaller version of a spotted cat called an ocelot, which also once in a while comes up here. Um, that I think we can be pretty confident that if a second Jaguar shows up in another mountain range, we hear about it. I mean, it shows up on cameras like, like the paparazzi out there. And then there's a whole <laughs> bunch of researchers, the researchers that have a whole bunch of cameras south of the U S Mexico border too, mm-hmm. to monitor and they're monitoring Jaguars. So they want to, they want to detect any Jaguar that comes up into the borderlands. And mm. when one shows up on a camera, it makes the news. It's, it's big news. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think we're pretty confident we have like one at a time. Wow. All right, folks, Jim and I have been having some technical difficulties today because it's a Tuesday, which is a lot like a Monday. <laughs> and I am now uh, on a, on no microphone, just talking into my computer so that you'll notice an audio change. We apologize for that. Um, Jim, thank you for your patience. Jaguars. Hey, I, I had a question. Um, so that's really interesting that they just come up here. Like how many, where do they come from and how many of them are there like South? I mean, yeah. are, they must be fairly limited, right? Yeah, they, they are. There's, there's like the last, there's an estimated 173,000 Jaguars in the world. And the, the epicenter is the Amazon rainforest. Like we always associate, um, Jaguars. But they do they do live in South um, Mexico, Central Mexico. The northernmost population is, I don't know exactly, 80 to 120 miles south of the, of the Arizona border. So there is this northern population that does throw off dispersers once in a while. And they, they head north, and it's always males, not females. Males dispersing, trying to find a new territory. And, and once in a while, one comes up north of the border finds our little sky islands with some white tails and, and sets up camp. And in some places, some cases stays for a couple of years, but there's so many cameras, trail cameras in all these mountain ranges in all the valleys, North and South of the border that we have a pretty good handle of when one shows up, the spots are individualized like a fingerprint. And so they can identify that individual by some unique spot that it has. A lot of times they set cameras up on both sides of the trail to get pictures of both sides of the Jaguar for that purpose for identification. So we really just have one at a time. Um, Jaguars historically were in the Southwest, were in Arizona, New Mexico. There's a debate whether there was a breeding population. There's some documentation of females with kittens. There's documentation of Jaguars as as far north as the Grand Canyon in Northern Arizona, but all of the records indicate that they were really unusual. When when one would show up and someone would shoot one, it it made the newspapers. And and that was before they had Instagram and Facebook. I mean, back then, to make the newspapers, it was a big deal. And one would make the newspapers but every 10 years or so. So they weren't very common. There were a few that filtered up from the Sierra Madre in Mexico and and found themselves in Arizona and got shot by early miners and early early settlers. So there's a a movement afoot by some environmentalists to to, um, translocate jaguars into Arizona and uh, New Mexico to force recovery. And then they want to, they'll be under the Endangered Species Act. And then um, they'll use the courts to force all kinds of things, um, using jaguars as a tool to, for, for other means. And I've argued against that. I mean, the jaguars need a lot of help in Mexico. Jaguar conservation needs a lot of help. The biggest problem is retaliatory killing by, by ranchers. In Mexico, they get a jaguar come in and they've got maybe 10 cattle and that's their livelihood. And the jaguar comes in and kills a couple. It's a really big deal for them. And so they get rid of the problem. They get rid of the jaguar and that's the biggest problem. But if we have conservation dollars, we shouldn't be forcing jaguars into areas they never really were except for um, occasional dispersers and then using the Endangered Species Act and the courts and all of that. Let's, if we've got some money for jaguar conservation, let's put it where jaguars really live and, and, um, and, and do some good things for, for jaguars. My guess is it's the, the, the movement's not really about jaguar conservation, if I address. Correct. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and in some, I guess, truthfully, for some people, it is. They just, jaguars are really cool. And I was, yeah. I was at a meeting once with mostly protectionist groups that were talking about moving jaguars. And, and they said, well, our models show that we need to uh, release about 30 jaguars into Arizona and New Mexico to have a viable population. And the biologist, the jaguar biologist from Mexico said, 
that's about twice the number of Jaguars we have in our area where you're talking about getting them from. You can't take Jaguars out of an area where they actually live and force them into the high elevation mountains with pine trees and snow. It doesn't make any sense. They're a tropical animal that barely reaches Arizona and New Mexico um, as dispersers. So there's just a lot of, no big surprise, a lot of shenanigans in the protectionist um, world with people trying to do things to add more species to the endangered species list. When I was down there hunting um, in Southern Arizona, I noticed that it's, there's an opposite down there. And that opposite is in the Northwest and the Rockies, whitetails live in the bottoms and mule deers live in the mountains. When I was down there, it was the opposite. The mule deer lived in the valleys and the coos deer would live. I mean, there's coos deer in the valley too, but like mm -hmm. no, right. generally, generally speaking, it was kind of flipped. What's the, what, why is that? Yeah, as you were starting to say that, I knew exactly where you were going with that because it's a really fascinating habitat relationship. Well, you're right, mule deer are mountain deer, but you come to southeastern Arizona and mule deer are below 4,000 feet in the desert grasslands like the mesquite studded desert grasslands. And then you get up a little higher in the elevation, you start getting the rocky, rugged, um, oak covered mountains and the whitetails are, are up in the mountains and completely the opposite of the Rocky Mountains. I've been trying to answer that question why that is for 30 years. Uh, I haven't figured it out. Nobody else has figured it out. Just some different ecological relationships they evolved in. We know whitetail like brushier habitat and mule deer like more open habitat. I mean, that's why whitetails are in the riparian valleys in Montana and mule deer in the more open mountain, mountain slopes. So it's the same kind of relationship here where you have mule deer being an open country animal they they gravitate to the open low low elevation grasslands and whitetail are up in the brushy mountain ranges so that relationship kind of makes sense but as you go from southern arizona to northern arizona you have you have whitetail in southern arizona out in this open grassland because they like the open areas you get up to north of phoenix up to flagstaff and all of a sudden you have mule deer like in a lot of other places mule deer are in the forest and they're in the the, the forest and the brushy areas, and you run out of whitetails. Whitetails don't live north farther than, the cow's whitetail don't live north farther than Flagstaff, and they're not very common around that forested area north of Flagstaff. So that relationship doesn't make any sense. If whitetails really like that brushy high elevation mountains, then they should dominate up there instead of mule deer, and they don't. They clearly don't. We've got what looks like Rocky Mountain mule deer up there in the mountains in the Ponderosa Pine. God, that's that, that is so funny, man. Very, very strange. And as much as I've, you can imagine, I've thought about deer and I've thought about that relationship for a long time. It just doesn't make sense. That's all I got. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> Gosh, really strange. Um, yeah, I hunted mule deer north of. Let's see, it had been north of Phoenix, south of the Flagstaff. Um, and as you got further in the mountains. There was still cow's deer up mm -hmm. there. In mm -hmm. fact, I shot one. Um, but like I was hunting mule deer and a cow's buck walked by me. I'm like, oh, sweet. Yeah. But yeah, the habitat I was in was not that much different than where I hunted down south. It was full of cow's deer and right. had very few mule deer. So yep. that is, that's really interesting. I wouldn't have thought about it like that. Yeah, and I have, um, I've flown areas, I mean, for 23 years, I was a regional biologist in southeastern Arizona, flew helicopter surveys every January on all these game management units. And there were places where we would survey and it was it was just oak studded ridges and um, classic cow's whitetail habitat. And we saw nothing but mule deer, mule deer, and not just one year, just, just mule deer live there and whitetail don't. And I asked the wildlife manager, this is bizarre. This is classic whitetail. I would take a picture of this habitat to show someone what cow's whitetail habitat looks like. And we're seeing nothing but mule deer. Why is that? And they said, I don't know. There's always been mule deer here. So, so there's some really, I'm, I'm glad we don't understand everything. It'd be really boring if we understood everything, but there's some really head scratching conundrums when it comes to whitetail and mule deer habitat use, even within Arizona. Let's talk about wolves in Arizona. Are there any current populations of wolves in Arizona? Yes. Uh, and then so we've got the, yeah, we've Go got the Mexican wolf. We were talking about cow's yeah. whitetail being the smaller version of the whitetail. Mexican wolf is a smaller version of, of the wolf that really evolved um, 
almost in isolation, not completely, but in, in um, fairly good isolation in the Sierra Madre, in the, the big mountain range that goes down the middle of Mexico. That That's where most of the Mexican wolves were. 90% of their historic range was in Mexico. They just used, the Mexican wolf just used the Sky Islands we talked about in southern New Mexico, southern Arizona. Some of those smaller Mexican wolves dispersed north into central Arizona, central New Mexico. There's this high elevation, Ponderosa Pine. We call it the Mugyan Rim or the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. It, it's a big block of high elevation, Ponderosa Pine. So some of the Mexican wolves dispersed up there. Some of the northern wolves that were called the, the Plains Wolf in northern uh, Arizona, northern New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, some of those dispersed down into this central Arizona. And we look at skull measurements of the historic wolf specimens, in central Arizona, New Mexico, they're a blending of that northern larger wolf and that smaller uh, Mexican wolf. So we know we had this small Mexican wolf in, in mostly Mexico, some Arizona and, um, and New Mexico. I was on in 2010, I was put on the Mexican wolf recovery team because of my expertise in ungulates. If you're going to recover wolves, you got to know a lot about what they eat and prey base and where the prey base is and being able to estimate density and biomass that they have available to eat. So I was on the on the recovery team. Um, the most of the other people on the recovery team were very protectionist. Um, spent most of their career with wolves. Really wanted to craft a recovery plan that would make it impossible to ever take Mexican wolves off the off the endangered species list. They wanted to kind of cook it in a way that they were always protected by the federal government and would never fall into the hands of the evil state agencies to manage wolves like we manage foxes and coyotes and, and other carnivores um, successfully. Um, so I battled on that recovery team for two years and they were headed off in a direction that I didn't think was supported by science, didn't make any sense. And so I resigned from the recovery team two, uh, after two years and, and wrote a, about a 16 page report highlighting what I thought were scientific flaws and process flaws and how the recovery team was going. And after my resignation in that letter, that recovery team ceased to continue to meet and the Fish and Wildlife Service um, realized that that wasn't working with that group of people and the things that they were coming up with as what they thought was Mexican wolf recovery. And so after several years, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, didn't go back to that recovery team, but um, assembled, they invited them, but then also assembled state wildlife agency people, other academics, those people that were on the past recovery team to get together and write a recovery plan that was more practical and something that could be achievable on the ground, something that would result in Mexican wolf recovery. And we did that in 2017. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of that because everybody worked together. And it's a plan that will recover Mexican wolves and bring them back um, to recover them in the Southwest, but not in a way where they trump everything else and not in a way where they're um, going to be protected forever, no matter what, but in, in a way that we just bring them back as native wildlife. And then the, the management gets turned over to the states and the, and the states manage them like all the other carnivores that they manage pretty successfully. Now, I know uh, the, the, the wolves that live in the Rocky Mountains, for example, their primary diet seems to be elk and moose, like the bigger ungulates in the Southwest desert, Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, in the areas that don't have elk, are those wolves living on, or will they be living on deer? Yeah, a much more diverse diet. So you have wolves in the northern part of the range, and they're eating moose and beaver. Um, or they're eating moose, and they're eating bison, and they're eating elk, and all these big animals. So they have a less diverse diet. It's only a few items, and they're big things. And if you go down in the southern latitudes, they've shown this with coyotes, where Coyotes in northern North America also have a simpler diet of bigger items. They just catch these big things they eat it. they're good for a week. And in the southern latitudes, coyotes like in Central America, they have this hugely diverse diet of fruits and insects and small mammals and rabbits and birds and all kinds of things. And so it was the same thing with Mexican wolves, where wolves in the northern um, latitudes are eating moose and, and caribou and, um, and elk, where Mexican wolves were eating um, cow's white tail, Gould's turkeys, those big jackrabbits that you saw, that's a pretty good meal. And, and uh, a lot more rodents and, and rabbits and those sorts of things. And that's, that's kind of a natural gradation you see in the latitudes. And so uh, Mexican wolves in Mexico evolved, and that's part of the reason they're smaller, eating this smaller white tail and, and turkeys and all of these other 
these other things. And so that's what they'll that's what they'll subsist on. Right now, with we've got um, two hundred a minimum of two hundred forty two Mexican wolves living in the wild in Arizona and New Mexico. The recovery program has been a great success so far, with that population growing at a rate of about 14% annually since 2009, a really good population growth rate. Haven't seen any impacts to ungulate populations uh, at this level, but with those wolves in about evenly distributed in Arizona and New Mexico, since there's elk there, they're preying on elk right now. The smaller Mexican wolves aren't having any problem um, bringing elk down but they didn't evolve with elk. And so that's not really a natural part of their prey. It's just, if you've got to chase a little, as you know, firsthand, if you got to chase a little cow's whitetail through the woods, or if you just go out into an opening with a whole bunch of elk and probably some calves and some that are wounded, it's a whole lot easier to get meat just by rushing a big group of elk on an opening than being a Mexican wolf pack trying to chase a little cow's whitetail through the forest. And so they're taking advantage of the elk that are available, but they, they evolved in Mexico without elk, and so they'll do fine without elk in Mexico. And there's a population in northern Mexico that is one wild population of wolves um, right now that biologists are studying and working on, and that's part of the recovery. It's not doing as well as the, the one in the U.S., but we're working, we're working down there with Mexican friends and colleagues down there to make that successful. What are the – so you've, you've been a part of and or written multiple books – can you tell the audience about these books and where they can get them? Yep. Um, because I think like there's so much to dive in here. There's no way we can do it an hour, hour and a half. Um, yep. And you are so knowledgeable, man. People need to read these books. I need to read these books. I know that I have one of your books. Um, um, do you do audiobook versions? Um, I haven't. No, there's. I think there are ebook versions of both of these. My okay. wife, my wife thinks that I'm full of crap. She doesn't really think I'm that knowledgeable. <laughs> well, that's just you know part of being a husband. <laughs> yeah, probably. Here, I I mentioned this one before. I mean, if you're interested in mule deer and black tailed deer, that I mean, that's it. That's all I can say. What, what, just for the people that aren't watching, that's called what again? It's it's called. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. It's ecology and management of black tailed and mule deer of North America. If you just uh -huh. Google that, um, it'll certainly it'll certainly pop up. We can. And put, then the other the other one that I was thinking about is Deer of the Southwest. Is that what that's called? Right. Yep. And I've got that one here. This one we were talking about evolution of um, of deer, and we've got original illustrations in in this book of a whole bunch of these extinct deer. Oh wow! Um, and so for. For anybody interested in that topic, that's a great resource for that. The only other uh, one of significance is, uh, as you mentioned, Deer of the Southwest, mm -hmm. Texas A&M University Press. That's available um, really anywhere. I, I have a website called DeerNut.com, D-E-R-N-U-T.com. And not only is the, the book sold there, I can, I can autograph a copy of the book if you want one, but I also have a couple hundred magazine articles in PDFs that are free that you can you can just look by category by species deer javelina javelina hunting um, deer information some things on hunting and conservation to so deernut.com would be worth checking out also i'm on instagram as uh cervid nut c-e-r-v-i-d-n-u-t at um and that's it on on um, on instagram cervid nut uh before before we we jump off, I think we're going to do two parts of this. Actually, since we've had so many issues today with technical difficulties, um, I, I have a hard stop, Jim, in six minutes. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question, and obviously this is a deeper subject than we can get into today. But mule deer is a hot topic. Mule deer management, mule deer numbers. The mule deer seem evolutionarily disadvantage from my point of view, <laughs> meaning mm -hmm. they seem very touchy um, mm -hmm. to environmental factors, uh, all the things. What what should be our high level perspective on, on mule deer management? Like, and where are the best resources to get information? Obviously your book would be probably mm -hmm. a good place to start, but there's yeah. a lot of debates going on right now. Point restrictions, ta limit tags, 
cut out hunting altogether, this, that, the other thing, right? It's a complicated yep. argument. But what would you say at a high level? Obviously, we can't dive into it all the way today. Yeah. No, but I can I can um, direct people to um, a source, too. You're right. I, I think mule deer are much more, you might say, fragile. They're just not as hardy as white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer, you screw up the habitat, you mess the habitat, you cut trees down, you plant crops. They love it. They love all of that stuff. For mule deer, it's, it's a little more fragile. Um, I also, we didn't mention, but I chair a mule deer working group for Western North America. So I'm the chairman of a working group that's sponsored by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. That's 24 Western Fish and Wildlife Agencies in the U.S. and Canada and in Western North America. And each one of those agencies has a mule deer, black tail deer rep on my, my mule deer working group. We have a website that's mule deer working group.com. It's just all one word, mule deer working group. Dot com. And if you go to there, we've produced um, habitat guidelines, what kind of habitat um, attributes mule deer need and black tailed deer need. And we have that divided by these seven ecoregions. So there's a whole document just on black tailed deer and, and what habitat, how you can improve their habitat and what habitat needs they have. And then we have, uh, we have documents on road crossing. We have documents on reseeding. So if you're a, a member of a, a state deer group or mule deer foundation chapter and want to do some habitat improvements, there's tons of resources on that website to give you some ideas of what you can do for mule deer in your area. And, and you say, what can we do in the future? It's all about mule deer populations are going to rise and fall. It's all about make sure they have the, the most habitat in the best condition possible. And throughout these weather fluctuations up and down, they'll always have a home to come back to. They'll always have a place to live. Mm. That's really, that's great, man. Uh, let's do part two, Jim. And uh, everybody go check out those books. Follow Jim on Instagram. Uh, definitely go check out that resource. I know that I'm going to mule deer is a hot debate right now. I love diving into blacktails, man. You should come out here and hunt a blacktail with me sometime. I know I, I did. I've hunted, um, Sitka blacktails twice on Prince of Wales Island. Oh, come wow. up empty both times, but my son last year killed a beautiful Sitka blacktail four by four with eye guards, which aren't that common. No, they're not. The Sitkas. No, they're not. Well, I appreciate you, Jim. Thank yep. you very much. All right. You bet. Thanks.